All right, so um, who's seen me give a talk before? Wow, not many. All right, well, you're in for something. Um, unfortunately, I am tethered. I usually like getting into the audience, so this is going to be your, a safe space, apparently, because I am leashed back up here and I can't get at you. Um, but one of the things that I like to do is, first of all, this is going to be a surprise. None of us know everything. I know, ah, pfft, except for that guy. All right, I'll be referring to him all talk. What's your name? Corey Steele. That sounds made up. It's bullshit. <laughs> so, Corey, what's his name? Scott. All right, Scott knows everything. I'm Bryson, I don't, and I can admit that. But my point is, I like these things to be collaborative. First of all, PowerPoint has got to be the worst way to try to communicate information. Hey, DC, there's a, there's a seat right there. Do rap battle? No? <laughs> um, and so if you have a question, um, I'm going to be throwing questions out. If you've got something you want to know or some other way, just raise your hand and let's, let's make this a, a mutual thing. Um, if you want to backslide into heckling, we can do that. I'm totally cool. I see you, man, Scott. We got it. We're good? We're good. See, I asked him, so everything has to be a safe space. So um, at DerbyCon, I was the last talk at DerbyCon, and I got iced in the middle of giving this talk. It was the first time I gave it. And I decided to share the ice with the audience by, that's where the splash zone joke came from, as I actually splash zoned the entire front audience by going <laughs> like that. And so I've already set these three up as the guinea pigs, but I asked him first, and first of all, Kevin here, he's like, yeah, sure, give it to me. And he's got his mouth open like this. He's a little fucking weird. <laughs> him, on the other hand, he's like, if you do that, I'll stab you. <laughs> he, just, he just patted his knife. <laughs> so I will not be doing the splash zone. This is why you asked first. So adversarial emulation. We're going to be talking about one thing during this whole presentation. Moving from a win-centric, knife-driven, ego model to one where we're making a difference in the enterprise. It's not about winning, unless it's our arcade game, in which case, if you're Carlos at Guardians, you can't win. Don't you do red teaming for a living? You try, clearly. <laughs> and Guardians is a good company. I'm not picking on them. I'm picking on Carlos. So this is me. Um, I founded Grimm. Grimm was my nickname. Um, a year ago, I spun out a company called Scythe when I did a capital raise. Um, and then I'm a co-founder of the nonprofit, the ICS Village. So if you've ever seen the ICS Village at DEF CON or a bunch of other conferences, that's partially my fault. <clears throat> and I like to be silly. All right, so the idea for Scythe, so this is not gonna be a product pitch, I'm just gonna give you a quick anchor to how I got into coming up the ideas we're gonna be talking about here. So a Fortune 50, um, one of them is in this audience. Um, I'm not gonna look at them, so that's gonna be not the giveaway. Um, they suffered a breach, you all know who they are, um, and they came to us with a, an initial problem set of looking at the whole industry and going, hey, once you do penetration testing and red teaming repeatedly over and over again, you kind of hit the end of the rainbow. And they found that they weren't able to assess themselves effectively anymore because the tool sets that they were using, the blue team was just right on it. They had attenuated themselves to those tools as opposed to the threat behaviors. Has anybody ever seen that? Scott, you're, you're shaking your head. Yeah? So we built it. And what we, what we came back with was, well, instead of building something that is static, we need to build something that we can break into pieces so it always looks different. And then from that, I came up with this idea that I call the bounded attack space philosophy. And simplistically, it's we in security have never solved anything. We haven't. Anybody in here secure? Anybody in here unhackable with one of those stickers? Why? Why aren't we secure? How many years of how many people that are a lot smarter than all of us have been working on this and we still haven't solved it? 
Because when we look at the entire kill chain of an attack, it's an infinitely unsolvable space. You can't actually solve it if you look at the whole piece. And so my point on bounding it is we have to find some way to bound that attack space so we're not looking at all of it. We're looking at a part that we can constrain. So another way to look at it is we're really good at this industry of understanding yesterday and then getting surprised tomorrow. What if we can find a model that's static enough that tomorrow is the same as today when we measure something? So that's the bounded attack space philosophy that I come up with um, that all flowed from that Fortune 50 and um, is kind of the underpinning philosophy to the rest of this talk. <clears throat> so the value of exploita post exploitation. <clears throat> so this goes into where can we bound? So the first point is if exploitation is infinite, first of all, is technical exploitation the only way an attacker can get on a computer? Corey, what's another way? Stolen credentials, social engineering, insider threat, non-technical things. Once they get on, though, that's my, my supposition is that's where we can bound it. But more importantly, because we're all a bunch of fucking nerds, we like nerd solutions to nerd problems. Are technical solutions the only answer? What's the difference? What does a technical solution miss out when we're looking at security? People. People. Those are your users. Do users always do what they're supposed to do? <laughs> Fuck no. <laughs> you really are feeling safe behind that projector, aren't you? You're like, ah, bold, I'm back here. Fuck no, those users don't. Users aren't the problem, though, but they need to be part of the solution. We need to understand how users are operating in that environment. When you try to put a security control or requirement on a user that makes their job harder, what do they do? They find a way around it. They hack the security control. Users become hackers if you incentivize them. So we need to understand that in the environment. OK, so let's get on some common definitions. Everyone's into purple now. If you're an executive, you're like, ah, oh, purple team. Anybody here work on a purple team? You can admit it. What's a purple team? Great question. OK, so starting from the far left, we have vulnerability scanning. I am looking for technical access. I am looking for, there are seats up here. I'm not offended when people are late to talks. Through vulnerability assessment, penetration testing, how hard is the system, how hard is it to get onto it, gain access to a blind red team. A blind red team is I'm working from a black box perspective, which we'll define in a slide, to the in-person purple team. Um, and then there's this concept, which is really a future thing, called a continuous purple team. But the purple team is where the red and the blue work together, and I don't have to conduct an offensive assessment on a system. So I'm bringing the business, I'm bringing the blue team into understanding, hey, can I validate these controls? And we don't need to launch an assessment across the entire environment to be able to figure that out. Is that? Does anybody do that? You, you, wait, you set me up? <laughs> Motherfucker. What's your name? John Smith. I don't believe you, John Smith. Do you know his name? You're sitting next to him. Yeah, you do. What's his name? Come on. All right. So what do you, what do, you do in your purple team? You were at B-Sides Augusta with me? Did we meet? Oh. Did you come to my talk? Yeah? And? How was it? Ooh. 
Wow. All right. Never mind. I'm, uh, I'm flipping the heckling flag back to a false. <laughs> I just got burned there twice. <laughs> Tail between the legs, coming back up here singed. Oh, look, another slide. <laughs> so are you, are you giving your purple team talk here? So is that available online? Because those were all recorded, right? Okay, so what is your name? And we can actually properly promote it. Ryan O'Horo from Target. Yes. Okay, I sent you a message on LinkedIn, um, on Twitter, saying like, hey, we should meet. Nice to meet you, Ryan. That's cool. That's really funny, actually. <laughs> this is the first time I've met somebody that I was trying to meet while I'm giving the talk, and they're, of course, fucking with me. <laughs> Kudos, Ryan. You are, a, you are a master. Purple team, ladies and gentlemen. This is what you can achieve. You too can transcend and fuck with speakers. So, this slide. All right. Red team and penetration testing. So, um, red teaming today, primarily exploitation focused, because, you know, when you get that shell and you're just like, ah, oh, it's Christmas. Feels good or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa, you know, pick your non-denominational holiday that makes you feel good. I'm not. Why don't you hold this, because I'll be tempted to use it. Um, the other problem, which a lot of this is tied to resource constraints, is that today's red teams are very much focused on what I call the surgical strike. I get in, I get in on a machine, I try to find a way to get domain, drop mic, boom, done. We won. And the business is like, okay, you, you won again. And then how many of us have done red teaming or pen testing where you come back a year later or whatever that time period is, and what, how much has been fixed? Why? Why is it never fixed? That one thing. Yeah, they fixed that one thing. Maybe. Maybe. Part of that is what did the business learn from that? When we're going to a business-centric perspective, I need to understand contextual business risk. Because you own domain, yes, okay. Does an actual adversary do that, though? Do APTs do that? No, it's not a real threat. But again, we're constrained. Companies don't go to a red team and say, all right, here is $2 million, you have nine months, We'll see you. It's more like, OK, we have some pennies in a jar. We're mostly compliance focused. And you've got a week. So the ecosystem is failing on both sides with that. <clears throat> so internal red teams, repeated engagements, they typically have privileged insider access. They work there. They sort of know the environment. Right, Ryan? The external red team, though, we get the advantage of somebody coming outside with a new look. Um, having done um, offensive security for a long period of time, whether it's different people, different organizations, different countries, there are just different ways that folks do things. And those differences are what's the interesting part. Um, but again, we see this challenge of the snapshot engagement. So my supposition is to do adversarial emulation, we need some things to change, and we need a different way to do this. Now, this is not going to be the wish list that's like, that's great, Bryson. I'm glad that you are saying these things. We don't have the time. We don't have the money. We don't have the resources, just like the rest of us. So along the way that we're talking about some of these high level, we're going to talk about some cheap tricks that you can do to emulate some adversaries in ways that aren't going to cost you a lot. So first of all, it needs to be customizable. We need a tool that looks like the adversary. We need a tool that emulates the adversary. We want repeatability, going back to the purple team aspect. The value of repeatability is one, I can now measure progress. Two, I can now do a workflow where the red team, the offensive side, has discovered something, and they can easily share that with the blue team side so that they can now replay that and use that 
to validate their detections, to validate their controls. I mean, at the end of the day, blue team is drowning in false positives, right? Their, their job is that tier one to three analyst in a SOC who is deluged with all of the alerts from all over the place. And it's like looking for a needle in the haystack. What if we can just help them make the haystack smaller? And a little bit smaller, and a little bit smaller. Alert fatigue is killing our industry. A great way to think about where I can make cheap choices is understanding the kill chain. So great example. I want to validate our application whitelist in our organization. So I'm going to use some executables, and I'm going to see, are these things able to, or do they get caught? Does the application whitelist work, and do they stop? They do. Great. Now, do I need to bring some sort of exploit to the table to defeat the application whitelist, or have I identified that as a control, as a defensive choke point that works? And so now, what if I just whitelist my executable so that I can see what happens further down the kill chain? That's a cheap trick now that we're starting to look where I can cheat and make it look like an adversary that was able to do something, move down the kill chain, without having to do something that is technically expensive and maybe I can't do at all. If we believe our threat is an APT, they can beat your whitelist. They can beat your sandbox. They can beat the controls that you have. And so what you need to do is start thinking about where do those choke points work and what happens next with the things that I already have. And now you've started a very cheap approach to adversarial emulation. So white blocks versus black box. White box, I give the red team all the knowledge. Here's the network, here's the email addresses, here's all the information you need to do to start. Black box, you don't know any of that. You're starting at the OSINT start part of the kill chain. Figure it out and learn it. Now, what's interesting for me is today, a friend of mine who used to work for me a long time ago just came out uh, with an article where he said, Red teams should only do black box. Anything else is wrong. Why do you, why do you say that? Purple team forever. So what does the purple team perspective give the boo on that, Ryan? I was kidding. I actually pulled that. Wastes time and money to do black box. Let's take that a step further. Um, do you happen to have Chinese APT OSINT capabilities in your back pocket? Well, they probably are on your phone, that's true, but I don't think that counts. Or the Russians, or the Iranians. By the way, there, there aren't that many actors that we have to worry about. We kind of know who they are. Um, but the point is, that part of the kill chain, where we're looking at, hey, start from scratch, no company really wants to pay for that. And no organization, short of actually one of those nation state capabilities, can effectively do it anyway. Because they're not going to just do simple social engineering and phishing or exploits or whatever they're, sorry, I, I got down the kill chain, I got lost. Um, back on the OSINT side, they're not gonna just do some simple you know, Google dorking and Google searches and show Dan. They actually can do some pretty sophisticated things over a time period, right? They might have a three-year plan on how to co-opt human assets in your organization to get everything that they want to know, because guess what? That's what they do, and they already do that. That time period, that commitment, that level of scale is not something you can effectively operate. So again, going back to our concept of we can cheaply do things that make somebody at an adversarial level, from an OSINT perspective, my supposition is if you give the red team a white box perspective, you've now treated them like an APT who would have gotten that same information over time. Security through obscurity does not work. How many times have we seen that? Look at critical infrastructure. For the longest time, they're like, well, nobody knows how this stuff works. Therefore, it's safe. Doesn't work. Anybody else disagree on that? I, I'm serious. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to be mean. I only reserve that for Scott or Ryan. What's up, Dave?
Okay, so he said executive buy-in comes from there are executives who are like, I'm hardcore. I don't want. I don't want that, right? I don't believe in that. I, I've met that before in consulting engagements, right? You go out there and they're like, yeah, I hear you. We think you're trying to cheat, so instead we want you to do it the hard way. Um, I actually know an engagement that Grimm is doing right now with a client that has that same perspective. Um, and I, we, we tried to have them go back and talk in and be like, no, you really need this kill chain thing because you know, giving us three weeks to try to do something and then if we fail, you feel good, but what did we actually accomplish? But I, I think that's a fair point that there are in fact executives who have the budgets and they're the ones who decide what happened. And some of them are just, no, I don't want that. I don't, I'm old school, right? You need to do it the hard way. So I agree. Any others? Can you come up here on the mic? Round of applause actually for that. That took some balls. Just from my personal experience, when I've encountered that with my own executives, if I'm able to show them how an attacker would eventually gather that information over a period of time, they're more likely to say, okay, move forward with that information then, and that will just be part of the assessment then. So it's just something I've encountered. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So defense validation. I actually don't remember what I was trying to say to the slide. <laughs> it's got unicorns. Woo! Um, wow, no, I'm looking at this like I've gone over these. I've done this talk at least three times, and I'm now just looking at the slide. I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm lost on it. Um, so. I, Defensive validation, right? We were talking about controls validation. Um, this kind of talks through, I think uh, we're going a little bit more into the red and the blue for what that, the combination of this is in aggregate the purple team. So the red team attempting to emulate threat behaviors, that creative and flexible adversary. Um, so from the advanced persistent threat today to being able to do the insider threat tomorrow. Um, controls validation. Yeah, you know what? I hate this slide. <laughs> Burn it. Executives. So what they're getting out of defense validation is, first of all, they're now looking a portfolio perspective of their investment. CISOs don't know what they're doing, because none of us do. They're spending money on people. They're spending money on tech they don't really know what they're getting for it. They read Gartner, they look at what their peers are doing, and it's kind of like, well, as long as I'm running faster than the person next to me, then I'm okay. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a lot of it because, and it's not their fault. How are they supposed to know? We don't have a way to validate these things. We don't have a way to measure them. And so, the understanding of value versus snake oil is really hard to do when you're at that level. So if we can do adversarial emulation to validate defenses, now we can start to give the executives that business concentric view, business centric view, to determine value to them. Because is your company set up the same as your company? Even if you had the same tools, they would need to be configured differently. You have to learn that for yourself. And then validating investments in people. Again, technical solutions to technical problems. People are the largest surface area in any organization. Who uses an MSSP in here? How do you know how good they are? Okay, so what he said, he immediately was just like, they're not. And he said, they find more things internally than they do. So why do you still have them? Uh, check the box. Check the box. So it makes like We're compliant, we look a certain way, and that's good enough. Because at the end of the day, while from a 
production perspective of finding alerts, they're there, they do some stuff, you do some stuff, and why change? Furthermore, how would you know what a good MSSP looks like anyway? Anybody else have a different thought on that one? You gotta measure your MSSP. Yeah, Kevin? They're good for 24-7 coverage when you don't have it at your organization. Okay. So kind of the same sort of thing, right? Like, we work nine to five. We may not have the scale, we might not have the people internally to be able to cover a 24-7 response. And we most likely, in a lot of organizations, are required by law to have that kind of response, so we have to be compliant. That's why most small and mid-sized businesses in the co this country use MSSPs because it's so expensive to build your own SOC. But we still want to, I would say we still should want to know how well they're working, right? Is there a service level agreement? How much are they able to find versus how much we're able to find? Or, you know, simplistically, are they even awake? This is threat intelligence today. <clears throat> Static identifiers, here's a hash, here's a signature, here's an IP, here's a domain. How do I know that those are bad? Well, I found them yesterday. Are those gonna be bad tomorrow? The adversary moves on, the adversary changes. They move to different IPs, they move to different domains. It's not hard to change the signature. Analyst reports. Who's read an analyst report before? Nobody? Oh, you have? And? What did it do for you? So hashes and domains were in the analyst reports. Well, the challenge is, here's this 40-page report that is going in intricate detail on what an adversary was doing, right? Somewhere in there, they're gonna talk about those domains and here's the hash. They're going to be talking about they use this command and control and they're gonna start talking through some of the techniques. They're gonna be explaining the TTPs of what that adversary was doing, but it's kinda of like, great, what am I supposed to do with that? Of course not. Well, I mean, that's what you do as an executive is you don't know things. That's your job. Shiny pictures, sometimes we like specific colors. Simple colors are good for us. Blue makes me feel safe. The purple, eh, purple's kind of a hippie color. It's sort of out there. This, this is, this market when it first, went, this sector when it was created, we had so much promise, right? Like, we're on the dark web. We have people who read multiple languages. We're going to tell you exactly what they do it before they do it to you. That sounds great, right? I read the marketing slick, and I'm like, yeah. And then this is what we got. So I'm giving a, I'm giving a talk at AttackCon uh, next week called Sticks in the Mud. And it's talking about that the sticks format, which underpins most of this threat intelligence that we're getting, is failing us because you can't do something if it's a verbal report. That takes a lot of effort on your part. Why doesn't the threat intelligence industry start to migrate to something that is machine readable so now we can start to find ways to ingest that without having to do manual reading with all the time we have in our free time? Um, and then this, is, uh, this was some research from our team that was presented at B-Side Sacramento. Um, they found a way to trick Impash so impash is one of the common ways to signature malware, and they found a way so that impash would always think the exact same malware was a different signature, which now starts to create foundational problems. So the threat intelligence of providing a static identifiers, that whole foundation might be at risk anyway. The pyramid of pain, who seen the pyramid of pain before? It's mandatory for these kinds of things if we're talking about we have to have the pyramid of pain because it's awesome. So there we are at the bottom with what threat intelligence gives us, which is from simple down to trivial. And up there at the top is the tough challenge where the industry is not giving us the information that we need to be able to do that. 
it takes a lot of individual heroics for us to be able to pull this together because it's not readily available. Um, and then there's, of course, the easiest way to do that, which is I take malware samples from the wild, I reverse engineer them, and I neuter them, and then I try to use those on my environment. Who's done that? Anybody? No? It's done. It takes a lot of effort, but the advantage is you are now getting an actual threat to test with. The disadvantage, of course, is that it's easy to signature that because that's going to be that static binary or DLL or whatever shell code um, that you, you neutered. And of course, going to executive buy-in, that's a long pole to climb to get an executive to agree, wait, you're going to do what on our environment? You're going to take something that's risky and deploy it? Most executives don't have the stomach for that. So this is where I think threat intelligence needs to go, where here is an example, and this graphic was derived from an idea that uh, Katie Nichols at MITRE um, did, where we have a description of a particular kind of threat, and we're able to tie it to parts from the MITRE attack framework. So we now have at least a way to describe the threat. We now have the beginning of what I would say is a machine-readable perspective on how to take that threat in and start to do something with it. So this is MITRE ATT&CK. Has anybody not heard of MITRE ATT&CK at this point? OK, because it's at, these, at some of these conferences I've been to, it was like every single title was MITRE ATT&CK, MITRE ATT&CK. Some people try to be clever with it. More MITRE ATT&CK. Um, so my point is MITRE ATT&CK has been, is a great idea that's being misused in our industry. From an adversarial emulation way, this is the periodic table to help us all have a common vernacular, a common language to describe a threat. That's great. That's good. The problem is, is this has become a checklist. Right? Am I good against drive-by compromise? Am I good against exploit public-facing application? It doesn't work that way. Second of all, part of why it doesn't work that way is Think of this, if this is a periodic table, an attack is a chemical equation. And the order of that equation matters. If I try to do privilege escalation without credentials, that's going to have a different result than if I do. Same thing for lateral movement. Or pick your poison on here. They're contextual. An actual adversary is an iterative intelligence campaign. I land. I do a technique. I use that technique to learn something. I then use that knowledge to do another technique, and so forth and so on. The order that I do that and what I gained from each of those techniques informs what happens at the next level. If I'm not looking at this in a contextual state, I'm missing the boat. And you're just going to be running after a checklist perspective of MITRE ATT&CK where your executives might feel good, you might even feel good, and nothing's actually changed On top of that, they've now broken TTPs into sub-TTPs. So there's a lot further detail coming on. Yeah, that's a, this is a post by Blake Strom. He's AKA Mr. Attack. Um, one thing I will say is MITRE is in fact very open to criticism and discussion on their, pla on their framework. If there's something you don't like, you can in fact email them and um, I'll give you Blake's phone number so you can call him and tell them what you don't like. No, but seriously, they, are, they really are open to um, what is a really good idea, and they are willing to be told where they're wrong. Because there were parts where there were TTPs that weren't really TTPs. And so there was some inconsistencies in the, the framework, and they've been open to changing that when that feedback comes in. Um, as of today or yesterday, they've now released the whole attack for cloud. So there's now a whole description of attacks for um, the cloud. So what I just said, open source options. So um, when I first did this talk at DerbyCon, this part of the talk, I actually tried to show how to do emulation with 
some particular open source platforms and that didn't go so well for various reasons. So we've now pivoted to this and um, a few of us are working with um, George Orchillas and we're gonna be pushing out in November um, our collaborative evaluation across um, uh, an empirical measurement of all of the open source C2 frameworks that are available. So we're tracking 30 different C2 frameworks, 25 of them are open source. Um, we're gonna be releasing the initial evaluation in um, November with a website um, called the c2matrix.com that's not out yet. What that website is gonna give you is the ability to go in and it'll have a decision tree for you to decide, hey, I want to be able to do these kinds of things and it's gonna recommend open source tools that'll be able to do that. After we push out our basic evaluation of all of the open source tools that are there, we're gonna be publishing how to do specific APT emulation with all the ones that make sense. So we'll pick like APT3, uh, Chinese espionage, and we will then be publishing how to do APT3 with all of the open source frameworks that make sense for that. So we're gonna be pushing that out to the community, so that's something that's coming. Um, and uh, the mistake I made for DerbyCon is this was a lot more work than I expected to, so I didn't quite have it all dialed in for DerbyCon. But uh, here I can tell you that it's coming any day now. We're working on it. And uh, we'll be looking for, again, other folks to collaborate and participate with this about this. So if that's something that you'd like to do, um, you know, please come up and say hi. Uh, happy to have your help. So Emotet, Nanocore, Remcos, TrickBot, 13, 14, 16. Notice any trends? What's that? Yeah, there's a lot of HTTP, HTTPS. Attackers like that because web traffic is a natural part of your organization. It's constantly changing. It's constantly changing. You have to be behaviorally focused. Did you have something you wanted to add, San Francisco? Nope, never mind. Oh, you're writing this down? You could just take a picture. I'll, I'll share these slides out so anybody, you don't, you don't have to like try to grab anything. So host activities. So if we're gonna do emulation, what do we wanna do? So there are fundamentally, there's host and there's network, right? What can I do on a host? So how do I do destruction in a production environment? How do I simulate ransomware? Can I? You think it's possible? Yes, Ryan. In VMs, that's one way. So I can essentially restrict the damage, right? Another way to simulate it is I can make copies of things and use local encryption facilities so that what I'm destroying doesn't matter. Escalation. So social engineering and zero and end days are a form of escalation. So if I can get you to give me your privileges, if I can listen and get those privileges, and then of course there's the fact that I can use exploitation. So this is where we can chain different things together to do exploitation to potentially raise it. Or again, going back to our if we are stuck at that level, we can just give the password and now, like in APT, we have privileges escalation. Persistence, services and user space. Um, persistence is tricky because most sophisticated malware never touches disk. If you're dealing with a true advanced threat, they are completely in memory. Why are they completely in memory? What's that? Less artifacts. So yeah, forensics, as soon as that computer's off, I disappear. So I don't want to be persistent in some cases. That's part of my stealth. How many defensive tools are good at memory analysis? One. Which one is that, Ryan? 
Volatility, yeah. Who said that? The anti-forensics guy. Um, all right. Okay, and then network activities. So, a real adversary almost never gets caught for host activities. Why do you think that is? Because they turn off the sound when they take the screenshot. <laughs> the, the light on the camera is another one that we, I've seen uh, that mistake made before. Um, but what you have for host defense for a real adversary is their test matrix. They can take that into their lab and they can test and they will not go into the wild until they already know they've beaten everything you have. Now, why doesn't that same logic work at the network level? So if I can beat you on the host all day long, why can't I beat you at the network? You've had the answer for everything so far. Like, no? You don't have the answer for that? What about you, DC? You got one? Okay, so why can I see a, an activity or a user going out on a port or, or, or something that's different than traditional pattern of life at the network level, whereas I can abuse the local host all day long with that same principle and not be seen? Better detection. So more standardization? So I would say it's because I can't beat the laws of physics. There's only so much I can do. Bingo. I have to go down to layer one like everybody else. What is clever that happens at layer one? Not a goddamn thing. <laughs> right? Now layer two, right? Now we're starting to put some protocol on top. Layer three protocol, layer four protocol. I have to look like everything else and I have to follow the laws. I can't not be on the wire. I have to talk. To exfiltrate means I have to use your communication mechanisms, which means I have to be seen. So if I have to be seen, what's the only solution I have? Blend in with pattern of life. So like what he was just saying, if I'm going out on a port that I shouldn't be going out on, that's an indicator that you can see because I can't not do it. I don't have a choice than to be seen. On the host, I can prevent being seen. On the network, I can't because I have to use the network the way you use the network. One of the things I always found really interesting about cybersecurity is it seems like it was the only domain I know in all of humankind where the attacker has the advantage. Why does the attacker know my space better than I do? Except at the network level. The defender dictates the terms of the network. You decide what communication protocols are allowed. You decide what ports are open. Your users use those communication protocols and those ports, and so there's now a pattern of life to your organization that this is what normal usage is at the network level. I have to blend in with that. Anything I do that doesn't look like that is how I, as an adversary, make my mistake. You dictate the terms. It's the one place you completely control, and I have no choice but to follow what you give me. So it's a finite space. Then lateral movement, so pivoting from endpoint to endpoint, password spraying to be able to then take over another computer, use of vulnerabilities to move into another computer. But it can also be that combination of network and host, because for me to move laterally means I need this host to be where I am moving from toward where I want to go. Most attackers don't know where they start. They just know they get a call back from some place in your organization, and the first thing they want to do is like, where am I? Is this where I want to be? 
If not, where do I need to go? Where do I steal the crown jewels? Where are the credit cards? Where's the PHI? Where's the PII? So I'm using host activities to then extend myself across the network. Each time I extend myself across that network, though, is your opportunity to get me. So defining if hosts should be talking to each other. Looking at how segments discuss. This is why network segmentation is such a great thing, because you're creating firewalls for me inside your organization that I have to navigate each time. Heterogeneity is the defender's friend. The disadvantage is the maintenance that backs it up. So that's the balance of maintenance and security, because we could isolate literally everything, but it would be completely terrible to maintain it. That's that balance. Okay. Ryan, do you want to just give this slide? With the microphone? Come on. You're way smarter about Purple Team than I am. You got to think. Are you fucking kidding me? Did you just say that? Dude, I'm in your talk, but I got a thing going on. It's important? Well, so is this. Look at all these people. Are you really trying to get work done right now? Okay. Wait, you have a life? You don't look like it. <laughs> Revenge is best served cold. <laughs> um, no, so first of all, I'll remind everyone, check out Rhino Horo's talk at B-Sides Augusta. It's on YouTube. Um, he has an entire hour going through the, the purple team aspect. We've covered a lot of it, so I imagine there is a lot of overlap. I regret not having been at his talk. That's something I will rectify. Um, the biggest thing I want to ha highlight here is where we have struggled in the past has been cultural differences. The red team saw itself as something different. You're one team. The paycheck comes from the same place. You need to work together. Um, for more beyond Ryan's talk, um, my friend uh, George Archillis has recently put together a two-day, that's more than one hour, two-day talk on purple teaming at, um, as part of SANS. Um, and he's also looking at putting together a six-day um, class in the future. Questions? Hi, Malice. No questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Where, how? Um, yeah, at Bryson Bort. That's my Twitter handle. I'll, I'll post it off of there. Okay. Thank you.